Good afternoon once again. We are here and once again, again, it is our great pleasure to be in your reality. It would be wonderful if you all had the same great pleasure to be in your reality. And that is one of our intentions to inspire you and to elevate you, your understanding of energy and the use of energy and how it is for free if you have your wits about you to use it. Uh, you are experiencing great pleasure by living, by being in your own reality. But over the years we have become deeply invested in the human experience. People ask us all manner of questions about this and that, and over the years um, we've had to wait for you to grow up. Just as you cannot explain all the intricacies of an adult life to a young child, it is sometimes challenging for us as Pleiadians, cosmic beings, visitors, etc., to convey to you all of the complexities that are involved in living in the multiverse when you are convinced that you are trapped in a random world uh, stuck in linear time. Nothing could be further from the truth. But it is so conditioned and programmed, uh, programmed in your DNA and conditioned within your experience of reality that we've had to wait many years to watch you slowly, as a people, begin to pull back the curtains, to question the sacred cows, to question institutions that you know killed you at one time, punished you, put you in prison, separated you from your loved ones because you questioned. And you may have questioned something very simple. You may have told the church you saw the stars move. That, believe it or not, was enough to get you in big trouble at one time. People were not supposed to understand the heavens. Perhaps you saw shooting stars. And you said the stars move. So within your experience of life, your ancestors and, and all the genetic memory, that goes back to, as our vehicle was discussing with you, the origins of some of your genetic heritage. But beyond that, you also have mixings of other stellar influences. People have said to us, Pleiadians, why are you so interested in our Earth? We said, because in some capacity we are your ancestors. But we are also, we who speak to you come from the future. Now, the Anunnaki have an obvious footprint on your planet. And this is being discovered left and right. Everything is unfolding and has been in terms of a larger picture of time, probably over the last 150 years. Age of Enlightenment, uh, the discoveries uh, in, in Egypt, discoveries in Sumer, and then the acceleration. Then you had the wars, World War I, World War II, uh, mass sacrifices to confuse people, to confuse the progress. Why at the same time the Industrial Revolution is, is really kicking into gear? And why people have jobs and they're working, but what are they really working for? From the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, that goes back to the 1700s, uh, one could say that you have rebuilt the Anunnaki infrastructure on your planet, the space systems. The Anunnaki, in visiting your world, had to construct spaceports, mission control centers, they had to lay out the land, landing pads, all this kind of thing for the rocketry that would move from earth to heaven. And remember, Anunnaki translates as those who from heaven to earth came. And 
you basically, if you step back and you say what's happened on Earth in the last 250 years, from the last time that, uh, that Pluto conjuncted the galactic center, it conjuncted the galactic center in 1760s and then again in 2007. And everything started to rip open in the now. What's happened is that you have the capability to get into the air and you have the capability and the ambition to go into space. Once many countries went into space, they found lots of opposition on Mars, on the Moon. Many probes have been turned off, shut down. Uh, astronauts, your space people who go up there, they have been seeing all kinds of things. And they have been sworn to secrecy even back from the 60s, 70s. They, some of them who cause trouble, or who wanted to speak about it. There were lots of nervous breakdowns among the astronauts, lots of medical problems. They were made heroes in the paper, and their families are falling apart behind the scene because they are forbidden from speaking about what they saw, and what they saw were obvious civil evidence of civilizations in space. Think about how contrary that is. Now it's not possible to keep the genie in the bottle to use one of your Earth colloquialisms. Everything is blowing up. A uh, vehicle explained the astrology to you, the timing. Uh, the Mayans were told way back when, when the long count calendar ends, big stuff is going to happen and we will return. The Christians, they're all up in a lather about the second coming. The Muslims, they are up in a lather about the return of the Mahdi, their prophet. The Hebrew Jews, they are sure that Jesus was not the prophet. There's someone else returning. You go into other parts of the world, and what you find are various prophecies and beliefs, different names, of course, and different calendar structures and methods of counting. But Synchro out of synchro, they all point sort of to an evolving now. Now from your point of view, you look at the clock and you say, well, it's midnight on 2012 and, and now it's uh, uh, not December 21 anymore, it's 22 and look, the world's still there, so must be that was all a hoax. That's your timing. You must understand that Time is a local custom, and that you are still and will be for many years in the window of the end. The end. The end of a way of understanding reality. And because of certain people in the cosmos who set up these calendars, there's support for assisting you to come out of one ending and to be birthed into a new beginning. Yet a new beginning cannot start until the old is rendered asunder or demolished. If you buy a piece of property and it's got some old shack on it, but you love the property and it's gorgeous and it's old, it's been maintained for a long time, uh, we're old, we say old growth trees, and it hasn't been disturbed for perhaps a hundred years, and there's some old shanty or two on it. Are you going to just build your modern home on top of the shanty? No. You either build in a different place or you demolish the shanty. This is what's happening now. To attempt to build on top of the old will not work. So the old must crumble. And it is all in timing. And sometimes from your point of view, it looks quite frightening. Because where's the paycheck going to come from? How am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to put the food on the table? All of these very basics. Now, in terms of these systemic changes, they are not happening solely on Earth. And because you are a very special place, living library, what happens here affects a lot of other life forms that have a genetic trace into your existence. Animals, plants, creatures, all of you. 
And because the humankind is undergoing uh, two things. You are racing towards extinction. Your scientists call it the sixth extinction. That is from their point of view. You've had these big extinctions on the planet before. And often what triggers a massive extinction uh, can be a number of components. Sometimes there is a radiation event that occurs from cosmic sources and many life forms die out or migrate to another version of Earth and other life forms adapt to the radiation and go to a new level. And it happens relatively quickly within decades, let's just say, not over tens of thousands of years. And sometimes someone pushes a button and says, we don't like what's happening on this Earth. Sometimes cosmic forces battle over Earth as to who has the right to own the library because you are full of resources, not just gold. The most valuable resource on this planet are the genetic material. So many beings are interested in Earth. Many are interested in maintaining your high gem quality. That means the pristine waters. That means supporting the life forms. And over the last, let's say, three, four, maybe five decades at the most, Many people have been contacted by ETs of various types. And you are highly tricked on these ETs because the Anunnaki, if they could design a prototype from which you are a descendant, a hybrid being, they can build any kind of creatures they want. Do you understand this? And then they can trick you and say, you see these creatures, they come from here. They really rule the earth and they are octopuses. You see these creatures here, they are raccoons. They are a separate race. They really rule the earth. You get the picture, folks, without us going into uh, too much detail here? That you have been tricked, not you, the governments of the world are meeting what are called organic life forms of robotoids of sorts that are built by the Anunnaki as forms of deception. They put them in rockets, they have them visit the Earth, the Earthlings go, wow, we're meeting ETs, there's so many of them out there. When perhaps they are models, they are designs, they are what you call uh, AI, we call it RT Intel, artificial intelligence. Yet it looks really real. So, so much of what you are going to go through in the next number of years will be dismantling not only what's in the DNA, but you will be dismantling your beliefs about what you think reality is. And it's unfolding so quickly, human consciousness into the complexities of the multiverse, that it's difficult for any of the humans to grasp these large pictures. And then if you can't grasp it, you put a belief on it, you say it must be like this, because that is as big as I can think. So understand that you are in a high learning curve. You are probably going to learn more in the next 10 years than you ever thought possible and reality is going to change this much. You are going to relearn, rethink everything. And then you will be helping others by generally moving into the healing arts to help sustain and support people through the trauma of, oh my God, that's not really real? And coming up to support you, Uranus and Aries, is all kind of new direction, new states of consciousness. So if you get new ideas to break away from the old, to be inspired, to be trained in understanding how the body really operates. Everyone wants to go into, what is it called, IT? What does that stand for?
Information technology. Information technology. You want to go into what the body can really do. That is where you are going to have the most rewarding profession, is to help people get well, not only in their physical body, but in their soul purpose, in the psyche. You get sick because you don't know how to deal with your emotional issues. And these emotional issues follow you from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. You get stabbed in the back in one lifetime, you have pain in the back in this one. In the same place you got stabbed. You have so much power that if you start saying, oh, that person's a pain in the back end, that person's a pain in the neck, and if you say those two words over and over again, guess what your body will do? It will follow your command. It does not care about the people. It listens to the words you say. You will have a pain in the neck and the pain in the back end. The power you have to playfully and creatively restructure your reality is at your command. Now, we know some of you would like to take us home with you, like we could be purchased, a little cuddly, to sit on your shoulder, to advise you, to whisper to you, to say, come on, say this, do this, do this. Part of evolving your spirit is to prove that you can do it. You use your own gumption, and you use ambition and goals and clarity of mind, and you say, I can, I will, I want to. That is what is required in these times, on a level that is practical, and yet it will take you into the cosmos. Right. Let's do questions, good ones. Impress us with how smart you are. Impress us with your ability to help everyone in the room and everyone on the planet. All right, we laid it out there thickly. All right, we'll start with Enlil's side here. Uh, Enlil family members, who would like to ask a question? Anna. Anna, yes, good. You're playing the game well. What's your question? You mentioned uh, Malachi, Saint Malachi. Father Malachi. Who is Father Malachi? He, he wrote out these prophecies. Our vehicle did say that. And he prophesied uh, little lines like poetry about the papacy. And, and he would use two or three or four lines about each pope as the pope would be selected by the co uh, College of Cardinals. And he started this 1300 something like this, so it's been going on. And he prophesied all the way through, and then he prophesied a last pope, and it just so happens that this pope you have now, according to his prophecy, falls into the last prophecy. And this is, according to this father, uh, is the last pope. That's interesting, yes? Yeah. And how could that be? Because, now here's a logical thinker, according to their uh, doctrination, but the pope is always God's representative on earth. So if this is the last of God's representative on earth, uh, ergo, or therefore, either God's giving up or God's coming back in herself. What do you think? Giving up or coming back? And how would this particular pope, who came from, he's Italian, but he well, spent lots of years in Argentina. Oh, that's quite synchronistic. That's one of the places that the Nazis uh, uh, hid themselves from and hung out, and especially Hitler was known to have been in Argentina. And so then you have now this last supposed pope coming from Argentina, but he's really Italian, and all popes must be Italian. You pretty much know that, except for a few exceptions. Hmm, it's what's really going on. Remember, on a soul level, these times in which you live are extraordinarily pivotal and powerful to rippling across the lines of time, not only to other species, but to your own multidimensional selves. Anything else on this uh, question? I know, thank you. All right, good. Who, this side, Enki side, who has question? Beatrice, vehicle I've mentioned, uh, planet Nibiru and where the Anunnaki's come from. Yes. And it's my understanding that uh, each time that in, during the 3,600 year cycle that Nibiru passes through our solar system, especially past the Earth and around the Sun, that it causes physical changes on a very large scale to the Earth. 
It can. It depends now on a number of things. It is called the planet of crossing, so that means it sort of bumps through the solar system. And it is also called the destroyer. It's one of its nicknames. And you know now that you have the sun in the middle of your solar system. And you realize now that this happens. It's a, it's a protocol or a form of how planets are set up. And the planets have their orbit. And so it depends, uh, Beatrice, on which side of the sun the timing of where Earth is and where the planet of the crossing is. If they sort of are in vicinity around the block from each other, then uh, all chaos breaks loose. And this passing has historically created oops, oodles of problems. It's just because of the large orbital plane and because your short memory, the Arus know what's happening and you forget. So what exactly is your question? Well, uh, you've answered some of it, but mo mostly is, are you, are you currently aware of how closely Nibiru is going to pass us if indeed it is passing through our solar system at this time? And if it is going to pass closely, will there be safe zones where there will be less disruption to the physical Earth? We will tell you what s some speculations are from scientifics who have broken ranks and realize that a big deception is going on on Earth. And here's their, their conjecture, and it is a valid point. It's not as if this X-12, Nibiru, Chernobyl, whatever you're going to call it, is singular. It is a larger planet. It's certainly not the size of Jupiter. That would be totally destructive to your system because you have the planetary sphere and then you would have the energy field, the various, you call them atmospheres, around the planetary sphere and the planet and the atmospheres would be filled with whatever the energy frequency or paradigm of the planet is. And then there would be, because of Nibiru's more comet-like activity, there would be what is called detris. Uh, Talus, uh, all the space junk that sort of accompanies Nibiru. In addition, Nibiru has been portrayed as uh, uh, sort of traveling in a delta type of um, configuration. That would mean it's, it's a high military uh, uh, sort of figure. You understand the delta to be this, like the like geese flying, one at the point and then all going backward. So you would have Nibiru in the center, and then allegedly seven moons, one point moon, around Nibiru. It's important to understand that a moon can be built, that an object can be harnessed, roped, corralled, brought in, shaped, and made to appear as if it is something, but it is really an artificial construct. Your moon is an example. You are going to meet a technology that an, an understanding of the cosmos is far beyond what anyone could even imagine. Yet, inside, if you make room, you all have DNA of the Anunnaki. And they know the story. So somewhere the story can make sense if you give yourself time and the, the buffer and the support of nature to process all this. So now the real question she's asking is how much destruction could there, may there be? It does depend on the orbital plan, but it also, your scientists would say there's nothing we can do about this. This is inevitable. Sometimes some things are inevitable which many of the Anunnaki understand as many extraterrestrials do the power of consciousness. There's also technologies, best word we can use, put in place long ago by visitors, by other colonizers, by helpers, and this technology is based under the Earth's surface and it activates a shield. A shield that is about 
7,000 plus miles, actually about 7,200 miles above Earth. And we'll point out the efficacy of this shield. Efficacy means efficiency. If you look at the moon, you look at Mars, you look at some of the other planets, they are pockmarked. Like they have had um, spots or something, yes, with craters everywhere. You don't see this with Earth, do you? No. How could it be that your closest neighbor, the moon, a quarter of a million miles away, about 240,000, has been hit over and over again and it's filled with craters? Why don't you have evidence of oodles of craters around your planet? You've been hit, not in recent times, because the shield is up. The question is, will someone activate the shield? Or will the Anunnaki turn the shield down? And then it depends when Buru will be in certain position. And then it will also depend on what state of consciousness the people of Earth are able to reach. Not so much on your own, but as things start activating from inside out of crisis. Crisis calls it up. You will fly to new levels if you can keep your wits and not use violence. And you may, you may, miss this one. But it's, you are going to get some disruptions of some sorts. Understand that the globalists are frightened. Understand that they took trillions of dollars, the global elites, using the military, using people from the surface that they kidnapped. And they had them build complexes underground. But we recently told some students of ours, we said, you know, what these globalists are finding, unfortunately, they've built these large cities, they've filled them with supplies, and they are supposed to be a place to run when the surface gets crazy. Go to Turkey and start exploring in Turkey, and you'll find the Turkish people did it thousands of years ago. Underground complexes, you'll find it in South America. You'll find it in the USA, you'll find it in Russia. You'll find that this technique of building underground in time of crossing is ancient. Now, what's happening today, it's all slick and modern. It's filled with all kinds of goodies and gourmet foods and waters and you name it. What's above is below. You get this? As above, so below. The, the, everything. But what's happening is what's below, way below, started becoming above. And as they came above, they came into these underground cities, which are your below. And they said, wow, look at these nice places that no one's living in. <laughs> we are making jokes, but we are saying some of these complexes have now been occupied. They've been taken over. And in many regards, folks, there's more going on beneath your feet than there is currently in the heavens. And people are seeing all manner of sightings every single day. So it's all heating up and, and to something, but there's no foregone conclusions. There's no guarantee that you are going to enter a time of complete planetary destruction due to the passing of Nibiru. More than likely, you are going to have systems being rearranged and go through a number of challenging years where you'll be dealing with really rebuilding reliable systems and so there will be a lot of quote survival issues for those who have not covered their bases. Anything else Beatrice? Um, the shield that you've mentioned. Yes. Is, uh, that is uh, avoiding the meteors and things that cause craters. Does this also have an impact on the gravitational pull that is caused what I would imagine by a passing of a larger entity such as Nibiru that would I my understanding is would shift the poles of the Earth drastically, as in sort of moving the crust of the Earth, which might cause things such as tidal waves and earthquakes, un other than the meteor showers and things that. that this is this is a very legitimate point. You have done your homework, and of course, many people believe you are now in a magnetic shift because things keep moving moving quickly. And just to let you know the power of the, the passing uh, uh, of a planet that uh, some say they see it, some say they don't, uh, that 
for years now, at least 10, 15 years, almost 20 years, the scientists have been observing uh, uh, atmospheric changes, uh, the brightness changes on planets, a polar activity, melting of caps, and this Nibiru is, is far, far away. So what we are saying is that energy can operate over distances of billions of miles in a cosmos that you cannot even measure. And yes, you will see, at least minimally, these types of results. Another thing to factor in is that the Anunnaki never really leave. They leave a skeletal crew on Mars, on the Moon perhaps, uh, inside the Earth, uh, in systems, in governments, in religions. They have their minions. And uh, things are accelerated now. And people living at the coastal regions too close, you are going to experience more and more problems with water. And yes, it is entirely possible that uh, it's, uh, coastal regions uh, will start to feel the turmoil. The earth will start changing. Uh, we believe our vehicle pointed out to you that when the planet Uranus moves into the sign of Taurus, that will be about 2018, you will have seven years. Seven and eight is 25, so from about 2018 through again 2025, 2026, things settle down and are more sorted out and you enter a new, quote, paradigm of understanding around 2028. And between then and now you have big astrological uh, changes that you go through, big ones, very, very big ones. Does that help you understand? It does. Um, just very quickly. Go ahead. Um, it's fine. There, as long as it's an intelligent question, <laughs> you are helping everyone understand. Okay. If we are to be a, sort of be aware of these uh, potential environmental hazards, such as uh, coastal areas and changes in the water, are we aware? Are you aware of when this is likely to begin? Because. Our understanding tells us it will likely be between August and the end of September or potentially December, but I wonder if you have any further knowledge on that. Well, many people are tuning in or they are piecing things together, they are decoding. Uh, the globalists do have a lot of plans for this year, understand it. And if things start to accelerate end of August, um, early September, there's, there's key gates that they're aiming for, uh, yet the best laid plans can be rendered asunder and thrown all out of, of the window because the gift the humans have is the gift of unpredictability. And as the masses change their minds, wake up, they shift the probs and understand Beatrice and everyone else that there have been many, many plans over the last five years that the globalists had to squish you, smosh you, uh, attack you, nuke you. Lots of it did not occur. The heaviest things happen in the most volatile areas where the people have the most fear and where they have the most guns and where they want to harm each other to get what they want. The lower the vibe, the more primitivo it is, and the more it is root chakra fighting another root chakra, that's where the st bad stuff happens. The more you raise your vibration, the more you can think clearly, and the more you can position yourself or change the probs or call in guidance for protection. We say this to you, you've never had a lifetime like this one. That's where everyone's here. And to some extent, it's new territory. To another extent, you have the Anunnaki inside you, their genetics, and to them it's old hat. But you must get your sea legs. So these are good questions. Now, things will accelerate. You will see activity at the last week of July. <coughs> This is the summer solstice weekend, and many plans are laid right around the summer solstice. Use the sun from the sky, use the light to come in and to inform you. Six weeks from now, you will come to what is called August 1st, or Lamas. 
The week prior to Lamas is a week of high ritual sacrifice among the globalists who like to control the world. The humans are harvesting the vegetables. The globalists are laying plans to wreck everything. Build your plans and love the earth and love yourself and understand that the forces of darkness and evil may undo themselves in a very spectacular way. But in order for them to be corralled and contained, those beings of goodness and integrity must live that out greater than ever before in their own generosity of beautiful living. It is big choices that you are occurring. They set things into motion and Lamas is often known as the sacrifice of the king. The king, a leader, often is sacrificed at Beltane to fertilize, to let the realities they want come into being. And then at the harvest time, another powerful person is sacrificed or killed to give thanks for the harvest because then the real kicker starts at the equinox. And there are suspicious events out there. But understand, you've set out to do things on your own and everything fell apart, yes? Anyone ever have that happen? Yes. A few snafus? The globalists are dealing with this all the time because do not think they all like each other and they get along. People who do not do good works do that to each other. They use each other. So they are battling bad insider. You follow this? And there's all kinds of things going on in all the governments of the world. So there could be things that start to happen end of August. People come home from vacation. September could be some big tricks, some big shifts. Just intend that you are in the right place. Everything will work out more than fine. And get smarter. Much, much, much smarter in terms of what you know. Who else has a question? It is now Enlil's side of the family. Paul. Who is it over here? Paul. Paul? Paul. Paul. Hello, hello, please. All right, loud and clear. Okay. You mentioned that our moon is artificial. Who built it? How do they use it and how does it affect us? The Anunnaki use it. How does it affect you? You are entrained with the cycles of the moon. Um, it is a supply base. Uh, most of it, many things occur inside of the moon because the Anunnaki are master builders. They know how to build. They know how to build on Earth, in the cosmos. That is their forte. Some of them are good at genetics, but they're really, really good at building. Rock, stone, glass, other substance you have no idea of. And they can shape worlds. They can build worlds like the moon, and then we'll make it real simple. Turn the key and fly off. <laughs> In other words, they can build structures and then use them to travel. This is important to understand. So if new things appear in the sky and they look like new artificial or new planets or something, it can be holographs, it can be literally something that is real, it's moved around. You must expand your what you think is possible. So they use it as a supply base, they use it as high ground. If you've been in military, uh, any military company is always going to go to high ground because you have a better vision than you can see. They have positioned it so that it appears in the sky to be exactly the same size as the Sun. Yet the Sun is 93 million miles from Earth, the Moon is a quarter of a million miles. Wow, that's miraculous. How does it affect you? It entrains you to certain cycles of consciousness. Is this bad? It is what you incarnated into. It is a system that you are not really probably going to change. But you know, a few years ago, someone must have figured something out. Ten years ago or something, our vehicle came across a, a statement by some scientific on your world. And he said, we could fix everything if we blew up the moon. Mm -hmm. And then that was it. He obviously knew something, yes? Yes. Yeah. Now, it's always best to work with what's around you. 
If you can't fix it, condition it. The moon itself is not bad. The Anunnaki, some of them have not the best of intentions, others have evil intentions, and others have good intentions. And it, the moon is basically reflecting the light of the sun. And so the cycles that you are in can be used. Ask any gardener that understands how to plant. Everything can be done by the moon, and you can gain tremendous benefits from the moon. But certainly they can use the moon to send frequencies at your earth, to do weather control to earth, to do all manner of things. And that is much more to say, but we will move on, Paul, to another question from someone else. Who else has a question on Enki's side? Lawrence. Hello. Lawrence, we heard your name loud and clear. Welcome. And you were talking about... Hi, peas. Hi, peas. Hi, peas. Good. We like to hear that hi. Just so that you know that we are really real and we do not want to be encyclopedias. Do you understand? <laughs> we are not encyclopedias or something that you can use because we look like we are available. That's why a little high just opens the protocols. All right, now continue. We were talking about how Mr. Lawrence. Moon affects our gardening. I yes. was reading about biodynamic gardening. Yes. Introduced by Rudolf Steiner. Yes. How does it, can it help our gardening on a, low, on a bigger scale? Uh, that we use astrology with our gardening? We'll study it. There's plenty of people who've done the research. Steiner was uh, certainly a genius in his own right, but his organization and everything got infiltrated very badly, you know, by the timing and the Nazis and all these kinds of things. But um, knowledge is knowledge. And many, many people are very, very smart today. And there's all manner of books out there about how to plant and when to plant. So uh, we cannot spare our time to educate that. We, we will certainly direct you towards uh, finding books in the library, online. And people have laid it all out. And, and we'll say this, those who know how to garden, uh, when to plant, when to harvest, it's not just the moon. It is the earth, it is the plants. Once you understand what they like and what helps them thrive, they can grow to magnanimous size. The, the, the fruits, the vegetables, people are going to go back to this. This is something that will bring them greater joy. People, too many people on your planet have no idea where food comes from, uh, what is involved in its process, and you have become ignorant completely as a people about something that you can't do without. Think about it. Think about that, really, the statement we've just made. And everyone, we would like to see everyone grow something, even if it's parsley. And parsley has all kinds of magnesium, and it's absolutely wonderful. You get it on your plate, you think, why do they put that ridiculous parsley on there? Because it is the ultimate digestivo and it enhances your system. And everyone needs to learn more about nature and food and how when the, the sun is in or the moon is in a sign of fire, it's not a good time to plant. When the moon is in a sign of water or earth, it is. And so you must study the cycles of the moon. And that means you must look up. And you start by knowing when there is the dark moon, the new moon, you had a few days ago, and then two weeks later, the full. New is when you plant, full is when you harvest. If you remember that, just those simple things. When it's dark, it's beginning. When it's full, it's lit up. This helps you understand how consciousness operates. And you ask anyone in the hospital profession, the arresting profession, that's law enforcement, or people with big families and schools, everything goes double bonkers at the full moon. Day before, day of, day after. Your plants love it. The plants love to grow under the moonlight. It gives a certain extra flavor and touch to the food. I mean, you've had tomatoes, and then you've had tomatoes. <laughs> and it's how you work with it and understand that just as your pets respond to your petting them and loving them and talking to them, plants love it when you treat them well. Even if you put your head out in the morning and say, Hi, garden, you're doing really well, I'll be out later. 
Sounds like you're a nutcase, right? But you're not. Everything responds to energy, especially your thought. If you want your garden to really grow, um, have a picnic around it and, and have kids play and make music. Don't play boom boxes and things, but to have someone sing or play music or dance. The plants love it. Everything responds to everything else. But you have become so electronically taken over as a people, you are losing your ability to understand nature. And this is where all the problems uh, can stem from. And you have really thrown your wits into these technology things over the last 10 years. And in the last five years, with all this smart this and smart that, they need to change the name from smart to dumb. <laughs> and if it was called a dumb phone, it did the exact same thing you would be so dumb that you would still buy it, even if it was announced. Sorry to insult you, but we can get away with it because we speak with our eyes closed. And you know that we have kindness in our hearts. We are just giving you the brutal truths, for friends, so that you can get awakened a little further. All right, whose turn is it? And real side, yes? Who has a question? Anna. Who is it? Anna. Anna, lou much louder. Okay. I have a question about pyramids. Uh, hi, peas. Hi, peas. Hi, peas. You have a question about pyramid mountains. You know, you have talked in the past about the pyramids. Of Kisa. Cannot hear a word or understand what you are saying. We're going to have to move to someone else, just Noel. because we can't. We cannot get it. Noel. Noel, go ahead. Thank you. Good. Uh, hello, peas. I have a question about the apparent increase in the numbers of transgender people are around at the moment? Yes. And I'm just the increase in the number of transgender people. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, is there any particular reason for this? Yes, it's, it has an agenda, of course. If there was no agenda, it wouldn't be in the media everywhere. Now, understand that you live again and again. You live as man, you live as woman. For most people, the soul makes the transition and adapts relatively easily. So that uh, you, when you're in the male body, uh, you are dealing with the male hormones. When you're in the female body, you are dealing with the female hormones. And this has worked in terms of reproduction, in terms of the stability of nature and the living library. It has worked for thousands and thousands, an untold number of years. What's happened, let's say, from maybe the 1950s, the 1960s, uh, a lady named Rachel Carson, we believe that's her name, she wrote a book called Silent Spring. And she wasn't scientific, and she sort of blew the whistle on the scientists and said, hey, you see all this DDT and all these poisons that you chemi people are making? And remember, the, the, one of the homes of the great chemical producers that caused all kinds of problems was Germany, I.B. Fabin. They are a big problem on the planet, along with DuPont, uh, along with you name it. They're Nestle's, they're all in it. They're the chemical companies. And uh, so it started uh, years back. And Rachel Carson saw it, and she said, hey, you're ruining the planet. The animals are, are, are growing double sex organs. Everything's getting confused. Then time moves forward, and then by now you have all kinds of uh, pharmaceuticals. And perhaps in the 80s, early 90s, scientists are saying, you know, we look at the reptiles. We look at the amphibians, uh, the little creatures that live by water. If they are going through transformation and they are having no genitals, uh, both genitals, if they are changing halfway through life, something's going on. Nature is messed up. Scientists say, yes, it is all the meds and pharmaceuticals and chemicals from plants, from cleanup, from electricity. You're polluting the earth. The, the stuff goes in the water, it goes in the air, and it breaks up the, the messages of continuity within the chromosomes, destroys the chromosomes. Chromosomes are within the cells and the DNA matter. Now, so this has always happened that either there's a soul mix-up, a person says, you know, I'm in a male body, but I remember being female, or I want to be female. I don't relate. Often they might not even believe in reincarnation, but they remember. Now, because of this 
ubiquitous spread of chemicals that are destroying your biological in integrity and in anything goes ultra permissive lifestyle and memories coming up without people understanding them people are insisting now that they are not who they are we are observing we will say this it is not a good idea to cut off body parts to change your identity whether it is a head plant transplant or whether it is putting a pig heart in your body or cutting off your penis or rearranging your vagina or adding breasts when there's none there if you have to put all kinds of medicines in the body to reshape the body and convince yourself that you are now what you are not because you cannot we know this is completely politically incorrect but again we are going to tell you the truth you cannot really turn a man into a woman or a woman into a man you can turn a person into an image of it and they may feel more comfortable because when they look in the mirror it meets their expectation but a man will never be a woman and a woman will never be a man you may want to be you may act like it you may you may think like it and you may take the hormones to make your body artificially feel that it is but if you stop taking the hormones you can't so what's happened is you have an ultra permissive society today there is an agenda by people who want to break down the family if they break down the family then they know that they'll create chaos on the planet the family the mother the father the children the the out picturing of the family that has always tolerated a few that are different and said well there's always an odd duck but we are a family once that goes out the window and you have no allegiance no place to sanctuary no place to turn to and no ability to reproduce which is happening to male and female everywhere they can't reproduce anymore you see the long term range and you have something on your planet that was called atlantis and one of the outstanding problems that came out of atlantis is in the anunnaki were uh, engaged in atlantis and it was anki and part of his family too much genetic engineering and they started to do exactly what you are doing today turning men into women and women into men and then they started building beings who were part animal and part human and most of this was to entertain but much of it was for sexual gratification do you understand what we are saying here what you do in the privacy of your own life is one thing but once the media gets a hold of it and they start driving messages and agendas you must ask yourself what's behind this and it is so important to understand that each person on the planet today can be very confused and there's lots of mixed up messages and there's lots of people who are used by others and put out there to manipulate the masses it is called psychological warfare it is most important that you are observant of this and yet allow people to make their own choices but to make yours based on being informed and on common sense does this help you yes, you're very welcome who has a question whose turn is it Elaine. Thank you, turn. Elaine, welcome. What's your question? Make sure Nigel can hear it. Hi, please. Can I just, can I ask about the weekend of the summer solstice and about Newgrange and Carrakeel in Sligo and its relevance to today? And its relevance to today. The second place we are not certain of, what is it called? It's called Carrakeel. It's in County Sligo. It's similar to Newgrange and it is a um, stone site which has the summer solstice activation, activation where the Newgrange has the winter solstice yes. activation yes. now as we've said timing in space is different than timing on earth 
If you were to move to Mars, it would be different timing because everything would be in a different position. And timing, in, in terms of understanding the solstices, uh, is very important. On, on a very prosaic or basic level, uh, people would know when to plant. They would know when to harvest, when to prepare for the seasons. That's a very basic level. But actually, the solar activity can open what is called black holes. And you understand that the center of the galaxy, the galactic center, has a massive black hole. It, massive, massive, massive. Yet recently, a galaxy was discovered that has a black hole trillions the size of your current sun. And they say that your, your black hole in your galaxy has thousands of times of your sun. It's a big jump from mil thousands to millions to trillions. So it sort of humbles you a little bit if you ever think that you understand the multiverse. Now, what does this really mean? It is said that the multiverse is non-local. That means that uh, there's, no, there's no distance that can separate you. That even though it appears to be distance, everything is linked. And places like Newgrange are multi-purposed. Sometimes they are libraries in stone. Meaning that if you knew how to read it, you could walk through there, sit around it, and receive data. Obviously, if it is built to be activated, meaning the light passes through to hit a heart uh, at a specific time, then that means that is the switch on date. But switched on to what? As the whom? Now, some of these mysterious sites, the pyramids, uh, new grains, etc., the, the stone circles, uh, things all over the planet. Sometimes they have been quiet. They receive the energy and they don't go into great activation. But a few decades ago, or in the last 10 years or some such, there's been problems uh, with sites activating, giving off signals, and emitting sounds and energies that humans don't hear, animals hear it, and the military knows, because the military, global military, has devices that can track activity. And they started hearing signals from different mountains, in, especially in Eastern Europe, that they found were not mountains. They were pyramids, covered over. Your planet's full of these kinds of things. Newgrange sits out there as an obvious spaceship, yes? Sort of. <laughs> and it's being slowly activated, as other sites are, over time, to affect you. Often these places are built to help create a stabilization of energy. And it is important to understand we know we are going to run out of time soon. It's important to understand that some of these sites, these very, very big, how did they build them sites, were built by giants. And it just so happens that your country, Ireland, has, was one of the places that the giants, Ant Atlantean giants one could call them, the Celts as you know them, they migrated out of Central Asia at a point in time after the flood waters receded and after everything calmed down on the surface after a trauma about 13,000 years ago. It came out thousand years, two thousand years later, many of them eight, eight thousand years ago they came out of the ground, that would be about ten thousand BC. And they began to leave Asia and filter across the land. Some went east, some went west, uh, some were of all sizes. There are records on your planet of giant beings existing 2,000 years ago, they were fighting with the Romans. 
And even then, the Romans were fighting giants that were easily 15 feet tall. You have biblical stories about, uh, who was it, Goliath, as opposed to the age 12 feet tall. But understand that skeletons have been found in various places around the planet long ago. When they find them today, they, they pretend they buried them. They call the military in, the site is closed down, the archaeologists are told don't speak of it, and that's it. People die and these giant bones are taken away. But the Romans were shown giant uh, skeletal forms by the Corinthians, Corinth being located in uh, Carthage, uh, northern Africa, around this area. And they had evidence of giants 36 to 40 feet. A Roman legion took a trip to uh, Morocco and was shown the grave of an 85-foot giant. So this is one of your Irish mysteries. You know all about the little people. <laughs> but are you the little people? If the giants here were 20 feet tall, you would be the little people. And yet you know that there are little teeny ones. The human protocol can come in all shapes. So what we are getting around to is that you have things here in Ireland, England also, Scotland, Europe, and things buried in Eastern Europe and China and Russia, things all over. But they're more available here because many beings were pushed. The Romans kept pushing the giants. They pushed them and pushed them further, further through Europe, away from Italy, away from, pushed them into France. And then they crossed over and they eventually, the giants long ago, came to Ireland. And they left many clues here. And what kind of giants were they? They were the red-headed giants. That's why you have so many red-headed Irish. You understand? And then their descendants were around 2,000 years ago when they lost their way, when they didn't lose their building skills. And they began to put a few constructs up here in Ireland as memory, as protection, and for the future. Does that help you understand it? Yes. A little, yes. Elaine? Yes. Good. Over here, who has a question, please? Lika. Who is it? Lika. Philippa? Lika. Lika Sailisa. All right, what, we can understand you, but go ahead, speak, so um, they can hear you in the back of the room. I just want to make a commentary. Um, hi, Palladians, first. Um, yes. Someone made the commentary. I just want to make a commentary on the, what you said about the family. They, have, they cannot hear you in the back of the room. I want to make a Stand up, please. I, have, I want to make a commentary on what you said about the family, the family unit. The family unit, all right. Yeah, I, just, uh, I think family is about love and it's about support. Um, and it doesn't matter if that family unit is a traditional family unit with a man and a woman, or if it's two women or two men. And having a family unit that's made of two women and two men doesn't mean that the children don't have male or female role models. Oh, that's very true, but again, without assistance, you cannot reproduce. And once again, there's always a little bit of difference. And we are not negating that at all. But if everyone starts giving up the family unit in the traditional way, it is going to eventually be the breakdown of the system. And that is the point we are making. Do you understand that? I understand and I disagree because uh, the family unit, the man and woman, the mo mostly I would say that would be the unit that's, that's in our society. Well, because that's but the unit that can reproduce. And, course, and having, sorry, having other units doesn't mean that there won't be children in it. You could have different types of families that still have kids. It doesn't mean it has to be a monogamous, for example, unit where it's just a man and a woman. The other thing is not everyone wants to reproduce. So... You know, it's it's also, you know, it's very varied. There's so many types and I don't see, I don't see that one model of a male and a female and we reproduce to be the standard. I think there's different models. The main thing is that there's respect, the main thing that there's love, and the main thing that when people have children, that they think about it and they really want to have them and they're really going to do their best to 
bring up a better humanity than the children. These and, are the things that... And that we concur with you, but we believe that uh, you are missing our point, and we see far into the future, and we understand that certain things get a snowball effect and where they end up going may not be where they are operating right now and that is our point is that you are soul spirit in a body and you are in a program called nature and it has a lot of room in it a lot of room for freedom of expression and there are certainly many ways that you can express your love and your sexuality but your ability to have a child and take responsibility for that child is yours. Not to say you have a child, you give it away and someone else cannot raise it with love. But the further that humankind moves away from their natural biological rhythm and process, the further all people move from that, it's going to make changes you cannot understand and we see far into the future and that is why we say that and we thank you for graciously sharing your point of view. Who has question on this side please? Who is it? Philip. Philip, yes. Um, Welcome. Talk, can you talk about how best to navigate towards your core beliefs and how to change them? If you need to. How to... How best to navigate towards your core beliefs? how to navigate towards your core beliefs. That doesn't really make sense because your core beliefs are what you really base and build your paradigm on. And lots of people do not even understand what they believe. So examining your core beliefs may be a better explanation of it how could I examine my core beliefs? So then we would say to you, all right, let's hit a few buttons and see what you believe. Do you believe truly with your whole heart that your body can heal itself? Or do you believe that if you get sick, you must go to doctor? Do you believe that you are fortunate and that good things happen to you? Or underneath, are you afraid you're not enough? Do you believe that there are good people in the world or that you always have to look over your shoulder over who's after you? Do you believe that certain people, because they have a certain configuration, uh, act a certain way or do a certain thing? Or do you believe that there are good people and bad people of all kinds and all configures and that you're pretty good about feeling the vibes of honest people and staying away from those that are not uh, uh, up to the best business. These are rather core beliefs that we just rolled off because they are like a foundation of a home. Core beliefs mean that you build the rest of your life around these core beliefs. So here's a core belief example. You're born into a highly structured religious family that says you must do this, 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 and this. And they lay down these, these beliefs and the entire family says, well, yes, and you never question the beliefs as to them being beliefs. You just think they're facts. And sometimes you can build a core belief structure around something that may not be entirely true, but because you invest in it, you turn it out to be true. Yet, in the end, you find out, I built on sand. Does that help you understand core beliefs, Philip? Yeah. So what is one of your core beliefs? Um, you said so many of them. <laughs> well, well, just your own. Like, I believe that... One of my core beliefs is that I can't seem to heal. That's what? I can't allow myself to heal fully. You can? Cannot. Cannot. Yeah. All right. So now... I get so far and then fall back. All right. So you you have a core belief that you cannot heal yourself. Not entirely. Not, not entirely. All right. So that's a core belief. So what happens is a core belief, then reality conforms to your core belief. 
So here's a way to trick it. You can say, you know, up till now, I used to believe that I could only heal myself to a certain point, and then I couldn't. But that's belief. And so I'm now going to add on to that belief that for one hour every day, I'm going to believe that I can heal myself at any point in any time. And it may take time. And it may take assistance from others giving me information or what to take or what to do. But that my body, thank you, can and will heal itself with loving support and the right, let's say, situations. And you believe it for one hour. And you really believe it. And you say, I really believe this is wonderful. And you feel it. And you say to your body, feel the healing. And you feel the power. And then after one hour, you say, all right, now I'm going back to my old beliefs that my body can heal itself, but it really can't. <laughs> Good. It's worth laughing at, because this is how foolish all people are. <laughs> And you are not unique, but you voiced your opinion, and it is very good. So listen to this. So here's how it goes. After a while, the next day, you might say, well, that's kind of stupid. If I believe it for one hour, maybe I'll start believing it for two hours. <laughs> Light bulbs go off, and you say, well, this is fun. Maybe next week I'll dare to believe it for half a day. And you start feeling it, and you believe in your body, and then your body says, well, let's... Let's give him a go for his money. And let's demonstrate to him that we really do have this power. Because he's believing that we do. So let's show him that we do. And you start to have something heal or something starts to change. And as you start working with things on this level, the body begins to respond. And you begin to recognize that you're not going to suddenly wish yourself into something other than what you are, but within your own biology, the cells hear what you say. They hear your core beliefs. They hear your limitations. They feel your fear. And so you must slowly start to send love to your body. Love your body, love your cells, eat the right foods. Just because your, your stomach may say, get me a McDonald's, you may know that a banana or a fresh apple might be better. And so as you start building and paying attention, your body will slowly change to support your beliefs. And it doesn't mean that miracles are going to occur. It means that without going for radiation or without going for frightening therapies, with herbs, with understanding, sometimes with technologies, magnets, uh, essential oils, there are all manner of ways that these cells will begin to respond. But it is also important that when you are wounded and you have a health issue, you must get to the core reason. <clears throat> and when you understand that your body is working with you and not against you, that your body when you are ill is letting you know that you have not integrated an experience. All illness begins as emotional trauma. Or it is carried over soul trauma from many lifetimes. Once you understand that you have a problem in the throat. There's an issue about speaking out. You have a problem in the genitals. Then there's an issue about your sexuality. For women, the uterus is home. Ovary, uterus, uterine problems, it's all un discomfort, dissatisfaction, problems in the home. Problems with the feet, inability to move forward. Problems with the knees, lack of humility or too much humility. Problems with the heart, too much controlling, not enough love. The body 
will literally work with you. And so again, we will send you to find some books, there's plenty of them out there, that delineate what the body is speaking to you as a person and what, you are, what issue you are working with. Once you get to the issue and you lighten up the burden on the body and you start feeling so depressed over what the issue is and you change your life, the body will start to move to healing with support with love, with nature, with sunshine. And of course, there's all manner of techniques that are on the rise and growing as to how to restore wellness among humankind. This is very big. Does that help you, Philip? Yes. And so what is your new core belief going to be? <laughs> um, well, I like Seth's one where he says, I am worthy because I am. That's a very good one. But if you don't believe it, then you're not. Do you understand? Yes. I am worthy because I am. You are worthy because look at your, you look at the miracle of your biology. Don't throw it away. Your bodies are miraculous beings. They are a temporary residence. You are spirit first. And you will always exist in dimensions that do not have bodies. And this was part of the Anunnaki's problem long ago. They would build bodies and no spirits would come in to occupy them because they didn't have high quality of life. You are worthy because you are and because in the grandness of Prime Creator, this being imbues all of its creations to seek out a high quality of life, a life of integrity, a life that does no damage, a life that does not destroy itself, a life that brings joy and that seeks love. Love could be considered uh, the multi-flavored uh, force of existence. It comes in many shapes and sizes and there's hardly much understanding of it on earth. But love is a generosity, it is a caring, and it always improves, it does not control. So understand that no matter who you are, what sexual identity, who you think you are, where you've been, where you are going, your reincarnations, they're all up for a new understanding. Live with dignity. Live with respect for all life, including your own. And do the very best job you can. And realize there's lots of conflicting differences going on and realizing you're being highly manipulated at this time. Make your best decisions. Get some good beliefs. Love yourself. Look in the mirror. And genuinely love yourself. And do not think about mother, father, grandparents, partners. When you generate love for yourself, you are creator, prime creator, saying hello to one of its most miraculous creations. We'll leave you to think about that over the evening. We'll see you tomorrow. It's been our great, great pleasure. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are here, and once again, it is our great pleasure to be in your reality. So you've had few hours to sleep on things, to chat it up among yourselves, and to consider the information and the energy that we are presenting you with. You've covered a lot of subjects, a lot of data, all absolutely necessary. And you've done well. You're still here, you're laughing, you figured out that a good laugh really opens you up and uh, let's say without being disrespectful at all, laughter or being able to see the cosmic humor in things frees you from being stuck into some sort of inevitable doomsday scenario. And of course the globalists or whoever they are and they have many names and many guises and many players, uh, they're agenda is to confound, confuse you, 
to call you, to eliminate you, but to eliminate you slowly so that they make a lot of money on you uh, through, let's say, ridiculous practices of uh, called medicine. And so to see through this paradigm is absolutely essential. Do not develop fear, hate, anxiety, resentment. These are worthless. If you ever feel this way, observe it and say, hmm, is this really, really the best attitude for me to have? And you can always move, do your best to go back to neutral and say, hmm, this is interesting, or this is very interesting, or this is overwhelmingly interesting, or I don't really like this, but for some reason I must experience it, see it, and there must be some purpose to my being exposed to whatever it is. There's always a purpose to everything in everyone's life, whether they believe it or not, whether the person is completely isolated from civilization, living in the Stone Age, or whether they are on Wall Street or in Hong Kong in the high rises running finance. Everything happens for a reason. When you operate with good intentions, when you are in your integrity, when you have very good boundaries, which means that you do not suffer from nice-itis. Nice-itis is a disease, a disease of being in the body, discomfort. Nice-itis is afraid of saying no. As soon as you don't know how to say no, you are screwed. Because that means you will not call a bucket of shit, shit. You might say it's a vase of roses. And there are many people who get that mixed up, even though they are distinctly two different things. Mm -hmm. Remember this. If it smells like shit, and it looks like shit, <laughs> it's manure. <laughs> and manure can be turned to fertilizer. So you can use something that's not so pleasant to help fertilize and grow your mind in awareness. But don't call the manure roses. Know the difference. Grow up and accept that you are living in a world of contradictions, of contrasts, a world that is going through a tremendous transformation. And within this process, you are going to encounter stories that are unpleasant. You are going to have to uncover things that you don't want to look at. It's not negative. Negative is when you start to put out hate, when you start to act hopeless and condemn. That's negativity, when you hurt another. But if you do not allow yourself to discuss what is going on, and if someone says, this is negative, we can't talk about this. Whose voice is that? How do you think leprosy was healed? Because people say, that is negative, that's ugly, let's run away from it. No, there was a priest named Father Damien or some such, and he took the lepers on an island called Molokai, in the chain of islands called Hawaii. He was very compassionate. He looked at the people whose flesh was rotting and horrible, who, who the public ran away from for centuries. He decided to help in this, in this darkness, in this ugliness. And so we use this analogy so that you can understand the larger scheme of things. As you start to uncover and recognize unpleasant situations, there may be people who call you names or who say, you are lowering the frequency, let's just talk about good things. That's escapism, that's denial. And if you are going to want to escape from knowing the stories, the fullness of them, the good and the bad, then you are going to lock yourself in your own hell of mind control. Because you only want to see the good side. Once you volunteer to find out about what's going on, observe your response to what you are finding out. 
if you can accept the fullness of stories and say, aha, this is not pleasant, however, I am now more informed about the general picture and now I will go cook a good supper. If you do not want to know, then you will be stopped in your tracks and then you will be very befuddled because you will not want to know the whole story, you will move into denial, denial creates confusion, eventually you become sick and delusional and people move away from you because you do not want to know. And this is what's happening generally in the world. Why do you think there's so much entertainment? You have 24 plus hours of entertainment every day all around the world. It is to keep people from thinking. You have to think. We've said that long ago many of you are here to witness. You are here to participate in unique historical occurrences. But like any point in history, the players do not know how important their era is. Yet you've all gone to school, you've studied history, and you study about Napoleon, or you study about wars, or achievements, or uh, discoveries, uh, building architecture. You discover, you read about these things, and yet when the people are doing them, they do not know that they are making a historical marker necessarily that will be referred to uh, hundreds of years down the road. Your point in time will be referred to across the lines of time for millennia. It's just that you are in it, you are at the party. And you look around and you say, is something going on? When is it going to happen? It's all happening now. And it's magnanimous in its energy to change not only your world, but to ripple out across the lines of time, and as we suggested yesterday, to ripple out into the Anunnaki Empire, their colonialism. You know, the Anunnaki, those who from earth, or those who from heaven to earth came, that is their translation, they operate with the caste system. And if you look to perhaps England, you have somewhat of a caste system. You have the royals, yes? Then beneath the royals or within the royals you have the aristocracy. Then you have what's called the gentry, landed gentry. And then you have the folks, yes? You get the categories. And even though people say it's, a, it's sort of a benevolent democracy and we, we have this and this and this, the hierarchy is still there. Uh, if you go to India, for example, it's, oh, the hierarchy is absolutely extreme. And there's no uh, mer meritocracy. Meritocracy is you work and through your efforts you raise your status in a society. This is uh, Europe, uh, most of Europe, North America, etc. India. Uh, what you are born into is where you are. If you are born into the untouchables, uh, it is impossible because the caste system holds you where you are. That is, let's say, an extreme example of the Anunnaki system. And it was Inanna, the granddaughter of, uh, granddaughter of Enlil, great-granddaughter of Anu, who was given the Indus Valley, and eventually was given India. The Indus Valley is now known today as Pakistan. Hmm, perhaps that's why you are in Pakistan, fighting wars. Enki was given Africa, and Enlil was given Mesopotamia, and let's say Jerusalem, what you call uh, uh, the Middle East. And these designations from long ago, the ownership is still there. The family fights over who has control, just like any family on earth that was not getting along, would fight over the inheritance, would cheat each other, would, would hurt each other just to gain supremacy in the family. 
We hear stories about this all the time. The matriarch or the patriarch of a family dies, the siblings are left, they are like roosters in a fight. They would destroy each other, cheat each other just to get a few more thousand dollars. Or get a few more of this, a few more of that. That is the Anunnaki psychosis. The Anunnaki suffer greatly from what you may call mental disturbances. And as above, so below, they have transferred their problems and their askewed thinking onto their delegates. Sometimes their delegates are selected. They are humans that represent them on the planet. Uh, in ancient past, they were called uh, pharaohs. They were called kings. They were called demigods. If the Anunnaki mated with the humans in recent times, as we said yesterday, it was verboten long ago. Hundreds of thousands of years ago when it first happened, it was the big sin, the big crime for the visiting extraterrestrials, the Anunnaki, to mate with their workers, their creation. And then worse, the construction workers, the Igigi, from Mars, mutinied. They came to Earth and they said, if you had gods, can have sex with the earthling lovelies. You cannot deprive us on Mars. We are your big workers. And this is where you get the story of the bad angels coming down to uh, have sex. They found the daughters of man comely. Well, rightly so. Women, uh, earthly women, have a certain allure, and that is quite wonderful. Uh, but uh, this is the source of many of the problems and the confusion. And again, you get to this idea of angels. Are there good angels? Let's say that the Anunnaki have a very clever way of tricking you, of having you think that something is all benevolent and nice when it's really part of their police force, their interdimensional police force. To be truthful, the human race, large majority of you suffer from naivete, extreme naivete. And then when you get naive, you want to get into denial because it is difficult to bust those certain paradigms and you become over-affiliated with concepts. And if those concepts turn out to be chocolate that just melted into a different shape, sometimes humans get mad because what they thought was true has no validity. We've seen it. Our vehicle has seen it. She deals with it a little bit more than we do. We deliver the information and then people often act out with her. We give you this bit of a soliloquy here because it's coming big. And they're just ahead, on the verge, around the corner, of very, very big shocking events. You will not be shocked because you will be prepared, but you still will be, have to have the reaction in the body because the nervous system will have to take the brunt of the change. Even though the mind may understand po the possibilities of what's coming, the body still has to integrate the data along the nervous system. So what you will be working with throughout the summer moons is to not only enhance your immune system, but uh, by eating well, sleeping well, hydrating, uh, this kind of thing, taking this, the additional supplements that may strengthen the body, good thoughts, writing down your intentions, all of this. But you are going to, your nervous system has to go to another level. So look to different practices that would uh, strengthen the nervous system. You have Mr. Batch, he's called Bach in the United States, but he was, uh, we believe, European man, and he created the Bach flower remedies. These are very subtle energies, and they work to strengthen the energy field and the nervous system. It's very important. Essential oils work on the subtle energy level. 
there is an Ayurvedic uh, uh, tradition, uh, uh, an herb called Gauta Kola. It really is a premier nervine. And what you want to focus on is do a little research and find out what are the substances that relax the body and strengthen the nervous system. That is what you are going to need. Understand that all technology weakens the aura, weakens the body, weakens the nervous system, and creates brain fog. No one is immune. No one. And you don't want to lose your noodles or your clarity. This is a big lifetime. Don't screw it up. But have a good time. Actually, we are going to mandate you. That's a little clever word there. But uh, we ask you, please, to have the best time this summer. To do things that put a smile on your face. To be highly creative. To restore joy in your life to reach out and to have genuine relationships and talks with people, to socialize, to laugh, to love those that you love, to build up a strong connection of happiness and goodness. This is going to be needed as part of your strength. These sound, things sound simple, but if you do them, you will be in better shape than many people will be once the autumn quarter or late summer begins to unfold. What is the number today? Is today the solstice? Yes. yes. Today is the solstice. <laughs> All right, Rema Kabla, this is wonderful because uh, this is the height of the sun and this is a peak day of the year, a turning point. So here we are by the seaside, Malahide, just outside of Dublin. And why are we in Ireland? Let's talk about Ireland a bit. We said yesterday that the giants, some of the giants of old, the old Atlantean giants, when the polar ice caps were causing problems about 13,000 years ago, the Anunnaki's knew that something big was going to happen. And let's say that the Anunnaki sometimes pretend that they are innocent of things that they are instigators of. It could be that 13,000 years ago that the melting of the ice caps and the great flood that uh, later occurred was instigated in part by the Anunnaki in their own foolishness. Just as today the global elites operate with weather manipulation techniques all over the globe and in their stupidity they have ruined the wind, the air currents and the earth is in complete turmoil and then they say it's all climate change and it's coming from someplace. It's all, not much of it is coming from their own psychosis and the craziness of the gods, the Anunnaki, is mirrored in the people that they use as their changelings, as their representatives on earth. The Anunnaki do not come down in general and mate with the humans today. Some, but not like it was before. So when they place people in charge, the people that they put in charge of their cross, of their, of their colonies, are those who either have Anunnaki blood, and it can be tracked, and perhaps you've noticed in the last 10, 15 years, that there's suddenly this desire or this calling to say to people, click on this and you can track your ancestry and if you send us a DNA sample, we will tell you what's in your DNA. And people are doing this and it's coming back and they get to, some people are being told that they have Neanderthal DNA. And then lots of people are reporting that when they do this, they get a four, five, six percent that is sent back to them that says unknown origins. Unknown origins on your DNA sample is code for star connections. Foreign DNA 
within the human genome. Those who have Anunnaki footprints, that are more prevalent than others, uh, this is how they are tracked. And this, people uh, at this time want to know the genetic makeup of the people on Earth. The ETs want to know. And so they assign humans to gather this kind of data. You are surveilled, you are watched uh, by many, many beings. Those who want to test you and who utilize machines to track you, they are weak in their own psychic abilities. There are others who do not need machines, they do not need to track and test your DNA. Uh, they can read your DNA, read your energy field. Understand that within the heavens, there are all kinds of beings, and they're not all equal. Some are highly skilled in one area, others are ignorant in that area. We said to you yesterday, the Anunnaki are supreme builders. Builders, that is what they do, they build. They can take anything, materials, and make large structures. Tunnels, buildings, pyramids, stones, you name it. And they know how to have things last for millions of years. Because they live millions of years. This is important to understand. It's also important to understand that we said yesterday there's more happening right now beneath your feet, inside the earth, than there is on the surface or in the heavens. And because of some secrets that are going on in world governments, they've been over many decades now detonating nuclear devices underground. And you've probably asked yourself, when you have a free moment to wonder, why would they keep bombing nuclear devices underground? They say, oh, we're, we're testing. How many times do you have to let a bomb off to test it? Right? It's like a kid with a box of candy. If you don't delegate how many pieces, the kid just keeps going. But that's not the way it works with atomic bombs. There's been a war going on beneath your feet. And those who have submarines, all the beings who operate, all the planet, countries who have submarines, they are always after the ETs that are in the water. So know that you share your planet with many life forms. You always have. There's always been a wide variety of life forms that have lived here. The human form as you currently understand it is one model. And this model has been in its own phase of development, uh, probably since the melting of the ice caps, uh, what you call the flood, uh, Noah's flood. Noah is also known as Utnapishna. Noah is, uh, let's say, in some stories, uh, Noah was given, uh, God spoke to Noah and said, build an ark. If you go back to the Sumerian records, you find out that uh, the god who spoke to Noah, Noah was Utnapishnam. And uh, it appears that it was the god Anki, the devil god, who spoke to Utnapishnam. And he didn't speak directly to Utnapishnam because the council said, it looks like the earth is going to flood, we'd better get out of here. And they decided not to warn the humans as they met in council. Remember, we said they meet in council for years, in your terms. 300 years, one month to them. They forbade everyone to warn the humans that there would be a big flood. But Utna Pishnam, Noah, appears to be a son of Enki, because Noah was known to have the shiny skin, the skin with scales upon it. And it was considered to be a badge of shame to have the reptilian energy within one, because the two brothers, Enlil and Enki, were always fighting with one another, upstaging one another. Enlil took the role of God 
one God, the Supreme God. When it comes to what's going on on this earth, this is Enlil, I am the commander. Father in heaven, that sounds a bit familiar religious, doesn't it? Our great father in heaven, Anu, gave me his son, the command of earth. Not you, my half-brother Enki, you are the devil. You are so much the devil, you have reptilian skin. These are ways of interpreting. So, Enki does not want to get in trouble with his father, Anu, with his brother, the one god, Enlil. So he says, he talks to a hut. And he says, read hut, read hut. But Uttapishnam, or Noah, is inside the hut. But he doesn't tell Noah, he tells the hut. He says, hut, hut, there's going to be a big flood. You better do something or you're going to be swept away in the flood hut. Rather simple way to trick, yes? He broke the law, but he could say, I didn't tell my son, I told the hut. Sounds like a bit of trickery. So Utnapishnam prepares. And as you were growing up and you heard this story about Noah's Ark, you had to wonder how Noah could get the pairs two by two, not to eat each other, or bite each other, or fight each other, and walk in pairs into the big ark. And how could he possibly provide enough food for them? And then what about all the manure? And what about the restless animals being tossed around in this big boat as the, as the earth floods for 40 days? Hmm, 40 days. The Anunnaki use numerical assignations. Anu is 60. Enlil is 50. Enki is 40. When you see these three numbers, 60, 50, 40, it's code for those members of the Anunnaki. You will find 40 throughout the biblical scriptures, and 40 is, is, is sort of laying the blame on Enki. Jesus wandered for 40 days, 40 days of the flood. Eh, you'll start to put things together. We know some of you are quite brilliant uh, with numbers and letters and things of this nature. So, the flood's coming. And it's not that it happens in an afternoon. There's warning. And the Anunnaki have many of their own kind here, their own giants, in addition to the human workers, the, the Lulu, as they were called, the first uh, making of peoples, uh, when they built the, the human creature, the hybrid, so to speak, uh, they called the first creation a Lulu. So the Lulus were not told, but the others were, the giants. And the other workers around knew that this was coming, and they took off. They said, uh, we know this is going to happen, and they migrated to the various openings, the tunnel systems that led into the center of the earth. Now, these openings are not here, there, and everywhere. There are areas that are easier to open into the earth and the Anunnaki's always had technology that today you call telemetry. Telemetry is a type of technology that allows one to see inside the earth. So for the last number of decades the satellites up in the heavens by the earth-oriented governments have been peering into the earth to see where structures are, where openings are, and looking at buried cities and what was here from long ago. And then they cordon these areas off or they have wars and they make sure archaeologists do not go there. Nonetheless, an opening, there was a big opening that many beings ran to and that was an opening that was in the, the Far East, in Mongolia. Mongolia is north of China, and you have China, which is about the size of the USA, then you have Mongolia, Nepal is in there, 
where the quake was recently. And then north of that is uh, uh, Soviet Union. In the Nepal region, in western China, the Anunnaki retreated and built their homes inside of mountains. They, the gods like to hang out in the mountains where they are inaccessible. We're talking the high level gods now. So it is one reason why the forces in the military are always going into the Hindu Kush. And there's all kinds of reports and have been for years about the UFO bases that rim northern India, that rim Nepal, Tibet, etc. Sometimes these areas are attacked by forces that create quakes to destroy what's underground. The humans are simply what they call casualties of war. So, long ago, 13,000 years ago, some such, lots of beings migrated into the openings inside the earth. Some went into the openings in the Middle East, the near Middle East, that would be Jerusalem, um, this big opening uh, up in Lebanon, because there is a big spaceport in Lebanon, it is called Baalbek. It did survive the Great Flood, it was one of the few structures that survived of the Great Pyramid as well. Uh, but there are openings to the center of the earth wherever these giant structures exist. There are ways to enter in. The structures are markers on the surface in addition to, to having a certain purpose. And so as beings attempted to get into these openings, they were shut off. So they migrated, migrated over to Mongolia, where there's big opening to get into the earth. Some people talk about Agatha, Shambhala. Uh, it's all legitimate, but part of it is myth and legend, a little bit of hocus pocus here and there, but the underlying story is true. There are openings to the inner earth worlds. The flood occurs. Of course, the entire globe is not covered with water. It's not possible. But many areas are deeply flooded. And the waters rise and rise and rise. And so this lasts the whole rehabilitation.